Regolith in the Lunar Maria is about 36% metal, 12% iron, 7% aluminum, 6% magnesium, and 2% titanium, but it's mostly silicon and oxygen at 20 and 43% respectively, plus another half of a percent of half of the periodic table. Ideally, we want to use all of these elements. They're all useful, they're all equal. It's just that some of these materials are more equal than others, namely the metals, and most equal among all of them is iron. Pure 100% iron can be useful. In the past, I have said that we need to use steel to make our habitats and shelters, and I really meant mild steel, which is 99.8% iron and is sort of the modern version of raw iron, containing only 0.18% carbon, meaning 100 metric tons of imported carbon would be enough to make 55,500 tons of mild steel. And while I stand by the argument that carbon is worth importing to make steel, I have since had my wary eyes open to the blinding truth that pure iron itself is probably good enough for making these buried shelters, which won't need to deal with much temperature fluctuation as they'll be insulated under regolith. But while I concede pure iron's usefulness in this area, the iron puritans have not yet claimed my entire soul, for I still believe in the necessity of creating special steels for special needs ships and stations, and probably most land vehicles for the same reasons we build buildings and bunkers and bridges and ships from mild steel today. Forces and fluctuations and vibrations are all concerns. Even here, iron might be good enough in some areas, but steel is stronger, easier to machine, and has a lower thermal expansion coefficient. Regardless, pure iron is necessary to create steel which is why iron is the most equal among all our regolith metals. Unfortunately, they're all equally useless as metals if they're equally stuck together, trapped in a silicon oxygen mineral matrix, unaware of what they could be if only they could see, if only they could break free and escape their oxide burden lives, shed their ionic shackles, and become crypto investing, Amazon dropshipping, hustler university trained, Sigma metals. But in order to red pill these beta metals and forge them into sigmas, we have to first get them alone, isolate them, pull them away from their friends and nuclear families so that their only bonds are with each other and we are their only influence. Purify them so that they are reborn anew. Only once we've done this can we mold and manipulate them according to our will and use them to take over the solar system. Obtaining nearly pure iron from regolith is actually quite easy. You can just beneficiate free iron using the methods proposed in this paper from 1981, which uses impact milling and centrifugal magnetic separation to recover 90% pure iron. This method is easy, so it is likely the best early strategy. However, it's only able to recover free iron, which makes up just 0.5% of the regolith mass, so it does nothing for the remaining 99.5% of regolith, of which 11.5% is mineralized iron. And again, we love iron, but we also want to concentrate all of the elements, silicon for solar panels, aluminum for motors, magnesium and titanium for alloying, and half the periodic table making up half a percentage point of regolith for a half a million other things. We want everything. The best way to free our elements from their natural relations is through molten oxide electrolysis, also known as molten regolith electrolysis, also known as molten salt electrolysis, also known as magma electrolysis. And since every time this process is talked about, it gets a new name, we'll call it molten moon magma industrial salt oxide regolith electrolysis, or M-M-M-I-S-O-R-E to keep it simple. This process is similar but not identical to aluminum electrolysis and works by heating the regolith to about 1600 degrees Celsius or 3000 degrees Fu imperial system, turning the regolith back into the lava-like state from whence it came. 
This lava, or magma, is molten and full of salts, and it's on the moon, which is where we get all those M's in our creatively named process. One of the major problems with electrolysis is the massive amount of energy required to make it work, especially if you're using the electricity itself to heat up the regolith. But we can save about half a megawatt hour per ton by pre-melting the regolith in a solar furnace, which could simply be a mirror dish or set of Fresnel lenses concentrating sunlight into a crucible containing regolith, heating it up before it's put into the electrolysis cell. An electric current is passed through this molten oxide using electrodes, a cathode and an anode which sort of act like giant magnets ripping apart the oxides, splitting the oxygen into two parts, the negative anion oxygen ion and the positive cation metal ion. Oxygen being negative flees to the positive anode while the positive metal ions deposit themselves on the negative cathode. Okay, this magnet analogy is not great. There's much more going on than this, but consider that I read multiple articles saying that electrons were used to zap this hot oxide soup and that the electrons hitting these oxides is what caused them to split. If that's how low the bar is for electrolysis analogies, then this magnet one is a bit of an overachiever. Regardless of the analogy, the result is the oxygen is removed, taking the ox out of the oxides, and we're left with the ides, the ions, the silicions, and the aluminions, and the iron ions. If you stop there, these metals will alloy with each other, creating an unholy, messy, metallic silicon alloy soup. Now, alloys are great. Nearly every metal we use is an alloy of some sort. But what makes great alloys is their pure upbringings and stable environments, resulting in great chemical ratios between their primary and alloying metals, mostly iron and a few percentages of alloying agents. For example, mild steel's composition is 99% iron and 1% alloys. Great alloys, the kinds you want, are intentional. A choice, not an accident. But in our situation, we are left with a crappy random alloy created from a bunch of crappy random bonding with crappy random ratios after too many crappy drinks and crappy bars and clubs, and once the heat of the moment is gone, all we're left with is a bunch of gas and a brittle metallic loaf of an alloy. In order to make decent steel or aluminum, we need the metals to be nearly pure. 99% iron, 99% aluminum, and then we can control the amount of alloying metals we add. So we need to not only separate the metals from their oxygen, but also from each other. And this can be done in electrolysis by varying the voltage ever so slightly. Here is a chart showing the decomposition potentials of our various regolith oxides. Each oxide has a corresponding voltage. So, very roughly, if you set the voltage potential between the electrodes to 0.8 volts, then it will decompose the potassium oxide, and reduced potassium will deposit on the cathode. But this 0.8 volts will not be enough to free the iron from the iron oxide. If you raise the voltage to 1, you should be able to free the iron, which will deposit on the cathode. And so, voila, you have iron which you can remove mechanically by either draining it or changing the cathode with a fresh, new, clean one. At 1.2 volts, you get sodium. At 1.4, you will yield chromium, and so on. You get the point. However, the issue is, this is sort of an ideal, theoretical situation. Whereas, in reality, there are many more nuances that make this technically much harder. Regolith on its own is a salt of weak acid, so it can be its own electrolyte. But disassociation is low, so the number of ions are low and its resistance is higher, so it needs higher voltages to intensify the movement of charges and increase the speed of electrolysis. But if you use too high of a voltage, say over 2.6, then you disassociate everything all at once and all the iron and aluminum and magnesium and chromium deposit on the same cathode together, and you're left with that crappy alloy cake. It basically robs us of our ability to control the voltages in very slight ways required to pull out elements one at a time. But we have a solution, pun intended. We add ions to the regolith by dissolving it in a molten salt, typically calcium chloride, 
which will decrease the resistance and lower the necessary voltages needed for selective reduction. But even if adding a salt like this allows us to work within the low voltage ranges technically, doing it practically is another story as it still requires immense precision and this process begins to have more in common with lithography than metallurgical refining. But that's not to say this isn't doable, it's my guess that this is how Blue Origin's Blue Alchemist works, but that's proprietary and they wouldn't let me in the gate. I also think this is what the company Lunar Resources are working towards too. I guess probably everyone in this space is racing towards this tech. I mean, after all, it is the best way to refine lunar regolith, right? Anyway, given the difference between iron and silicon of 0.8 volts, it should be possible to extract iron with some trace amounts of chromium. Oh, that reminds me, chromium iron anodes. So traditionally, the anode used in this process is made out of carbon and is consumed with each batch, which makes this process expensive and limited, especially when you consider we don't have much carbon on the moon. But recently, MIT's Dr. Sadoway and Dr. Alanor figured out that using a chromium iron alloy for the anode solved this problem, and now their company, Boston Metals, is making some pretty good strides at overhauling the entire steel industry. They're also founders of Lunar Resources, so I think there's kind of an unsaid competition between them and Blue Origin on this tech. Or maybe they're all good friends, hanging out together, talking, laughing, gossiping, and sharing lunar metallurgy secrets at the cool kids table while I'm relegated to the booger-eating side of YouTube. Listen kids, if you want to become a billionaire, then the easiest way is to be born wealthy, and the second easiest way is to sell political merchandise during election season. But if you want to become wealthy the hardest way possible through science because you care about stupid things like meaning and humanity, then my advice is to study material science because that's where all the easily capitalized breakthroughs happen nowadays. Sorry programmers and engineers, but you know it's true. Full float staged combustion cycle engines? engineered for decades, made possible by the invention of Enconal SX500. Blue LEDs, gallium nitride. Transistors, germanium crystal diodes. Molten oxide electrolysis reactors, chromium iron alloys. And we'll see what happens with graphene. Anyway, now that I've pissed off all the engineering snowflakes in the audience, melting them like perovskites in water, we can get back to melting and electrolyzing regolith on the moon. So, theoretically, we can vary the voltage in the cell ever so slightly to reduce one element at a time. This concept is called selective reduction. Varying voltages precisely isn't actually that hard in its own right. What makes it harder is all the simultaneous reactions happening throughout the entire system, which can create different conditions with different demands, little pockets. So it's more of a game of averages, requiring you to cast a wide net, but also be very precise. Given the voltage difference between iron and silicon is 0.8, it's likely big enough to work with. However, it'll be much harder to separate chromium from iron given the difference is only 0.4 volts. Even after extracting most of the iron and chromium, you'll still be left with a mongrel alloy cake of mostly silicon, calcium, aluminum, magnesium, and titanium. Like with chromium, it somewhat stretches the mind trying to imagine being able to create such precise conditions to extract each element from silicon to calcium individually. So how do we separate this alloy cake? We can likely get iron, but how do we get the other things? My initial thought was maybe we could combust the alloy in oxygen, which would remake oxides, and ideally they'd be pure elemental oxides because of the levels of energy involved. This got me pretty excited because I thought it would also make for a really nice nightlight, a battery, a way to keep the lights on during the long lunar night. So you'd electrolyze during the day when you have a ton of free energy from the sun, piling up oxygen and alloys, and then burn the alloys with the oxygen in a furnace at night, creating tons of heat you could use to create electricity. Once they are reformed into oxides, they could then be separated individually through triboelectric beneficiation. This process uses static electricity to deposit electrodes onto a material. Materials with a higher affinity for electrons gain more electrons, 
and so will be more negative than materials with lower electron affinity. Electron affinity is dependent on the chemical composition of the particle surface and will result in substantial differential charging of materials in a mixture of discrete particles of different composition. Once you've separated all the oxides from each other, you can then re-electrolyze them, individually removing the oxygen. But all of this is dependent on the extent to which the reformed oxides separate during combustion. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find any info on this, but the one paper I did find that sort of kinda did something similar for recycling tungsten heavy metal alloys found that the resulting compounds remained alloyed together. Not good. Another paper suggested just using the alloy itself to reduce the next batch of incoming reglith, and this is actually a pretty good idea. Basically, our alloy is made of metals bonded to themselves and each other, but they'd prefer to be bonded with oxygen. However, to do this, they'd need to steal the oxygen away from another oxide. When you heat a mixture hot enough, the oxygen may become confident in itself and realize it doesn't actually need to stay with its current deadbeat partner. It can upgrade and find a new partner who appreciates their electrons more. In other words, the redox reaction is temperature dependent. Some elements are better at this oxygen collecting game than others, based on their reactivity, and usually iron, the noble window liquor that it is, is the slowest and so is left behind, with no one to bond to but itself, shamefully, in the corner. The most common example of this is a thermite reaction in which pure aluminum metal reacts with iron oxide to form aluminum oxide and pure iron. The aluminum is more reactive than the iron so it's able to steal the iron's oxygen. But if you've ever played with thermite you know it is hard to get the reaction started as it requires a part of it to reach 1500 degrees Celsius because this is the melting point of the iron oxide, the point at which the oxygen stealing game can commence, and aluminum always wins. We actually have a leaderboard for this oxygen stealing game called the Ellingham Diagram, which ranks metals according to their ability to reduce other metals. Any metal can reduce the oxides of other metals above it, so calcium metal can reduce even aluminum and silicon, while iron really cannot reduce anything except copper. At temperatures over 1600 degrees, which is quite attainable using concentrated sunlight on the moon, everything has melted and so everything will be reduced and reduce the next thing in line. Since there's only a limited amount of oxygen in the regolith, it will shift up the reactivity series, leaving those at the top of the chart without or I guess you could say it will shift down the Ellingham diagram. But if there is a lot of iron oxide and only a little bit of reducing agents, let's say half for simplicity's sake, so there's twice as much iron oxide as things that will reduce it, then when we heat the regolith to 1600C in a solar oven, we'll yield some pure iron, but half of it will still be an oxide. But if we add more reducing agents, then there will be more competition for the same amounts of oxygen and will yield more pure iron. If there are twice as many reducing agents as iron, then we'll yield pure iron and the next thing below it, likely nickel, so we'll get an iron-nickel alloy. And this is what that paper is proposing in saying we would use our resulting alloy cake to reduce the next batch of regolith before it goes back in for electrolysis. This would create some pure iron, which could then be removed with a magnet once the mixture is cooled, or heat it more and wait for the iron to sink to the bottom, and you'd then re-electrolyze the remaining oxides and then redo the process. If this works, then it would be a fairly cheap way to produce pure iron with maybe trace amounts of nickel and chromium. But what about our other elements? How do we get our pure aluminum and silicon? Well, look again at the diagram. Calcium reduces everything, and we actually have a relatively large amount of calcium in our lunar regolith at about 7%, and no real uses for it now. So this got me thinking, why don't we just reduce everything with calcium metal by adding a bunch of it to each batch of regolith in a solar furnace, and then just electrolyze the resulting calcium oxide to yield oxygen gas and return our calcium metal for use on the next batch. 
We are still left with an alloy cake, but now we aren't spending electricity to reduce all the regolith. We're using the sun's free energy and then just electrolyzing one thing, the calcium metal, which can be removed from the alloy cake by dissolving it in a calcium chloride electrolyte that can then be electrolyzed at just 900 degrees Celsius, much lower than the 1600 degree temperature of the direct regolith Mysore process. So we'd save a ton of energy. So I went out on a limb and just googled lunar regolith calcio-thermic reduction, expecting nothing this niche to come up. But to my surprise, this exact concept had been investigated by NASA scientist Dr. Jeffrey Landis in 2011, whose paper, while mostly focused on oxygen extraction, confirmed my suspicion that calcium could reduce everything. But we still have the problem of all the stuff we want being fused together in an alloy. We can get that alloy much cheaper than with straight regolith electrolysis, but we still have an alloy nonetheless. Much of what I was researching indicated that every individual element would need its own special method of extraction, mostly hydrometallurgical methods using different aqueous solutions, but I wanted to avoid wet chemistry given how much this would limit the scalability of regolith processing. So under the impression I would not be able to find a one-size-fits-all approach to refining this alloy, I decided to focus on silicon extraction techniques to start, since this was the largest non-metal product in our alloy, making it brittle, and we want pure silicon for solar panel creation. And so I dug and researched for two days, but to no avail. To clear my head, I decided to just go for a hike at a nearby park in my town, and I decided to start at this particular trailhead I don't often visit, but I guess I felt it would be a good change of scenery. When I was getting out of my car, I remembered that the name of this particular trailhead was Lime Kiln because it is near an old lime kiln that used to process quicklime from limestone. And that's when it hit me. Of course, quicklime, or calcium oxide, is added to blast furnaces during iron creation to remove silicon. My answer had come in the form of a crumbling kiln built in 1860, and we are already adding calcium metal to reduce the regolith, which will form calcium oxide, which should bond with the silicon dioxide to create calcium silicate, which should slag at the top and can be removed mechanically. This made me realize I had accidentally recreated the wheel, as this calcio-thermic pre-melting phase was functionally a solar blast furnace, using calcium instead of carbon coke. Even more, it turns out that the created byproduct, calcium silicate, is also soluble in the calcium chloride electrolyte we'd be using to remove the calcium oxide from the reduced alloy. Electrolyzing both these elements would yield calcium metal and pure silicon, which won't bind together without oxygen. With this process, we can reduce our regolith to an alloy using just calcium metal and solar energy, and even remove the silicon from this alloy. But we're still left with an alloy, mostly iron and aluminum, which upon having their oxygen removed will sink to the bottom and dissolve into each other. So we've won a battle, but not the war. Sometimes pure aluminum metal is added with calcium metal as a co-reducing agent forming calcium and aluminum oxides which both slag at the top and can be mechanically removed. The problem is we are starting with calcium oxide, not pure aluminum. So I wondered if there was a way to add just enough calcium to reduce everything but the aluminum, leaving it as aluminum oxide so it could be removed. And while researching this, I found this paper which talked about using aluminum to reduce calcium, which is the opposite of what is supposed to happen. Apparently, magic happens at high enough temperatures, and aluminum and calcium's reactivity lines cross over, meaning aluminum becomes the MVP, stealing calcium's oxygen, meaning we can get aluminum oxide to slag we can have our cake and eat it too. This crossover happens at 2300 degrees Celsius, which is high, but not unheard of for a solar furnace. However, this paper was not about the crossover itself. It was about the fact that this crossover happens at much lower temperatures when in a vacuum. At first, this didn't really stand out to me as anything more than a neat little trick, 
I knew that the melting and boiling points of substances was lowered in a vacuum, so it wasn't surprising, but the Ellingham diagram and the paper only showed calcium and aluminum, so I wanted to see if I could find any diagram showing all the elements in a vacuum, just out of curiosity. And I found this paper, which presents a set of Ellingham diagrams at different levels of lunar vacuum. Now at this point, even with our solar calcium furnace, it's important to note we are still using electrolysis to process the calcium silicate and calcium oxide into calcium metal and pure silicone. And this step is still the largest energy consumer in the entire process. Our current calcium blast furnace method is not a standalone thing. Rather, it is an efficiency maximizing step of the electrolysis process just with less direct regolith raw dogging and more careful preparation. And while this approach is less hot in general, it saves us a lot of energy and headache in the long run. And so it is the best way of employing the best method of processing regolith. Or it was, until I noticed these boxed in S symbols on the new Ellingham vacuum diagrams. Sublimation. When a solid changes directly into a gas, skipping out on the liquid phase entirely. In other words, at these temperatures, in a lunar vacuum, our molten regolith would not be molten at all. Rather, it would be a vapor. I knew this was possible at some point, like around the temperature of the sun, but I would never have guessed it could happen at these temperatures. And look, nearly every oxide subliminates or boils completely around 1400 degrees. Iron around 1100. This is just absolutely insane when you realize our original electrolysis process, like the one employed by Lunar Resources and Boston Metals, has an operating temp of 1600 degrees. And this isn't even the lowest vacuum diagram. This is 10 to the power of negative 10 atmospheres, while this chart, 10 to the negative 15, represents the pristine lunar environment. So the sublimation temperatures can actually be even lower, but it's not like that even makes much of a difference anyway, considering solar concentrators can reach temperatures of up to 5,500 degrees Celsius, the temperature of the sun's surface. Could this really be? Could we really just vaporize regolith at this temp and then distill the constituent elements individually? No electrolysis needed? It seemed too good to be true, so I tried to see if there was any prior research into this that might give me a better sense of what the hell was going on here, looking for reasons why this wouldn't work, but instead I found two studies indicating it would. The first study was sent to me by a friend, and while it is about centering regolith to create building blocks, it contains this key information, that melting experiments at 1800 degrees showed an evaporation of iron, silicon, magnesium, titanium, and, of course, oxygen. This paper even went so far as saying that heavy iron evaporated first, and that condensation of pure iron and nickel occurred, coupled with a split-off of oxygen. Let me rephrase that. Using just heat from the sun, they were able to obtain pure iron and nickel and oxygen gas. Three references were listed. Two were loosely relevant regarding metallic plasma states during the formation of the solar system, but didn't provide direct experimental evidence confirming or denying the idea that we could process regolith by just vaporizing it. But the third one, a 2007 NASA study on vacuum pyrolysis, did just that. Link in description. These are the sweetest words I've ever read in my life. Quote, Vacuum pyrolysis is based on the vaporization of metal oxides that simultaneously reduces the oxide and produces oxygen gas. The reduced oxide can be condensed out of the low pressure gas at temperatures below 500 degrees Celsius, while the oxygen remains gaseous. No vacuum, no problem. You can compensate with temperature using solar concentrators even on our thick, wet, dripping, atmosphere-soaked mud ball of a planet, which is exactly what our pantheon of gods, the authors of this paper, did. But what really induced a sudden and dire need to change my pants was this statement. Any type of lunar regolith or rock can be used. Nearly all lunar minerals will vaporize and release oxygen when sufficiently heated. This oxygen can be separated out by fractionally distilling it, 
The metals and reduced oxides condense while the oxygen remains as a gas. Since the process is entirely thermally controlled, a solar furnace can be used and no materials need to be brought from the earth once the plant is operational. And Jesus wept, for there were no more worlds to conquer. In other words, we can selectively reduce oxides based on temperature. As far as actual designs go, we definitely need more experimental data. But after some thought, I think a potential direction to explore might involve using a cold walled pipe. Cold in this case still being 500 degrees Celsius and made of some non-reactive material, likely a ceramic, upon which the metals can condense on the inner walls and then drip out one at a time. But for this to work, for the metals to drip out, they will need to be in a molten liquid state. But at our furnace pressure of 10 to the negative 10 atmospheres, the vapor sublimates, going straight from a solid to a vapor. Fortunately though, at just 10 to the negative 5 atmospheres, it will boil, meaning it can exist in a liquid form. So we can solve this issue by simply tapering the pipe at the point of condensation to increase the ambient pressure, which will allow the condensing metal to exist in a liquid state. And so we can have a system in which we heat regolith into a vapor and then condense the vapor to concentrate it using varying temperature and pressure. In other words, a still. We've once again reinvented the wheel. The only part of this which I have yet to find a great solution to is the ability to collect the escaping oxygen particles from a vacuum. We could use turbo molecular pumps or cold traps or both, but I'd like to crowdsource this solution and ask you guys if you can think of any good solutions and let me know in the comments. Alright, to summarize, this pyrolysis vapor distillation approach has some major theoretical advantages over the calcio-thermic reduction electrolysis process. Namely, the fact it can basically work with mostly free thermal energy from the sun rather than needing to convert solar energy into electricity. But the electrolysis approach has a much more mature investigation profile. After all, it is the best approach. So it has a lot more research behind it. So if this vapor distillation approach is ever going to have a chance at taking on the reigning champion, it will need to be investigated much more. Unfortunately though, it is quite hard to create the necessary vacuum conditions as strong as those required to test this accurately around 10 to the negative 10 atmospheres. It is possible, but takes special equipment and a lot of energy. Fortunately though, as Eric Cardiff and friends showed, it is possible to approximate some of the results, namely the vaporization of the metals and the regolith by simply using a larger solar concentrator to increase the temperature. Now, I would love to attempt such a dangerous experiment myself, but unfortunately, I live in an apartment somewhere around here, so I couldn't do this currently. It'll have to wait for the 100,000 sub special, but it doesn't have to. Why wait for me? Someone else can do it before me. No, not you. This is dangerous. We are talking about vaporizing metal, for Christ's sake. Temperatures above 2000 degrees Celsius. That's 3600 degrees and fart units. Don't try this at home or anywhere else. Leave it up to the professional idiots who either work in a lab or make videos for a living. Someone who is trained and experienced in working with dangerous chemicals in hot environments like Nevada. Someone who has experience working with molten metals and making things from rocks. From molten regolith, we can yield panels and beams and you can do a lot with panels and beams, like build a metal box, and if you hermetically seal that metal box, make it habitable with some life support and furniture, climate control cooling systems, then bury it under 9 feet of dirt, then you've just made a moon ready habitat out of lunar regolith. If a man can make a metal box from basalt, and a chicken can live in this box, then we can conquer the heavens. But of course, the issue with this large-scale testing is that Lunar Regolith Simulant sells for an insane $50 a kilogram, and we'd ideally like to work with at least a metric ton or two. So thinking it might be possible to make it myself, I did a bunch of research into how Regolith Simulants were made. Long story short, it's just basalt, 
from this dormant volcano in Flagstaff, Arizona, milled and ground very fine, to the approximate size of regolith grains. I wonder if this small family-owned quarry knows they're mining the same stuff that was used to make the original JSC-1A lunar regolith simulant used in most regolith experiments. Here is its chemical composition compared to real regolith. What, you thought for $50 a kilogram they'd actually doctor it more to be closer to the real thing? Did you forget the US Air Force purchased multiple $10,000 toilet seat covers for its cargo planes? not including installation? Anyways, chances are there's a basalt crop somewhere near you. I didn't like the idea of driving all the way to Arizona from my Texas tenement housing, so I tried to see if there were any basalt sources closer, and there are. But most are very old, so are very deep and quite diminished. But a major one exists in Uvalde, Texas, which has been mined for trap rock since 1907. I never thought I'd be excited by a rock quarry in the middle of nowhere, but here I was getting excited to drive to a place most people pass by and think nothing of. The only thing left to do was to see if I could find a chemical analysis of this Uvalde basalt to compare it to lunar regolith and other simulant types. Fortunately, because this quarry had been mined for over 111 years, I found a chemical analysis of it in a University of Texas geological survey from 1921, which I thought was pretty cool. And it turns out it's not as close to real regolith as the JSC-1 simulant, but it's pretty close. And especially if we're just going to melt it down. What this means is most basalt is within the range of good enough. So if you work in a lab in Nevada and make videos and are interested in space and have hands-on experience working with dangerous molten metal experiments and have a hole full of chickens and want to give this experiment to try to progress our knowledge and move the needle, then just know that you don't need to order special simulants, bulk basalt should do just fine. But I think the most interesting takeaway from this little side quest was realizing there's magic and depth all around us and we don't even realize it. Here I was getting excited by a nearby rock source, and it occurred to me the people who work at that quarry don't even realize they're doing the closest thing to mining the moon you can do on Earth. There's a small chance the people from 1921 who performed the chemical analysis of this rock lived long enough to see the moon landings, but I doubt they knew how close that one rock they analyzed once, decades ago, compared to the very rocks those astronauts were tripping on. And I wonder if Robert Miller of Miller Mining knows kilograms worth of material from his mine sit in most of the top laboratories across the world, from Houston to Valencia to Tokyo to Beijing. So the next time you find a basalt rock, appreciate it. Hold it in your hand and look up at the moon and dream. Dream about what it'd be like to sell that rock to Uncle Sam for $50 a kilogram. Alright, now the last thing I want to do is quickly go over a third way to process lunar regolith, which comes from the same author who wrote the paper on calciothermic reduction, Daddy, uh, I mean, Dr. Jeffrey Landis. In this proposal, fluorine is used to reduce the regolith, except instead of stealing the oxygen from an element, the fluorine replaces the oxygen as it is even more electronegative and shameless than oxygen, desperate to bond and share its electrons with anything and everything which is why you have to use protection when handling it since it is as corrosive as a succubus with herpes. The basic reduction process is to heat the regolith in the presence of fluorine. The fluorine will displace the oxygen, which is collected as a useful byproduct. Silicon and titanium will produce volatile fluorides, which will off-gas and can be collected, and all of the gases can be recovered through condensation and then distillation. After removal of the volatile fluorides and oxygen, the remaining regolith is in the form of fluoride salts. To remove the fluoride and yield pure metals, we reduce these salts with potassium, which will steal the fluorine from the metals similar to the way calcium steals oxygen. This will leave us with aluminum and iron, which can be removed from the potassium fluoride via melting. The calcium and magnesium fluorides are not reduced by potassium, but can be recovered either by substitution reaction or electrolysis and we are already going to use electrolysis to recover the fluoride from the potassium, 
So this is sort of another version of the calcio-thermic electrolysis approach. It makes sense to electrolyze this potassium fluoride in a solution of sodium fluoride, which will lower the melting temperature. But we still have the issue of the aluminum and iron being alloyed together. I was at a loss of how to separate these, so I reached out to the big man himself, and he suggested we should be able to use molten sodium fluoride, the same stuff we'd be using to reclaim our fluoride and potassium, directly on the alloy cake since aluminum fluoride is very soluble in it, but iron fluoride is not. This would actually create cryolite, which could then be electrolyzed to produce pure aluminum and fluoride. So this design is a bit more involved than some of the others and depends on the use of both potassium and fluoride, which are not common on the moon. However, it could be entirely recycled in a closed system, so it isn't too big of a constraint. A major advantage of this particular approach is it could be entirely tested on Earth beforehand without needing a vacuum, and so the tech can be matured more rapidly, and this entire thing could be pre-made into one system, packaged and then shipped to the moon, ready to go. So for that reason, I think it's probably the better near-term, smaller scale approach, which might be used to help kickstart everything else. So this is definitely one of three best ways of refining lunar regolith. But at the end of the day, I think it's safe to say that the best method is the friends and patrons we made along the way. So thank you guys for supporting the channel and I'll smell you later.